Prime Minister, it is an honour and a pleasure for me to welcome you in our Assembly, which brings together members of Parliament from all over Europe and beyond to support human rights, democracy and rule of law. Prime Minister, we are all too well aware of the great challenges that Greece is facing and the steps and sacrifices that your people and your government have made take. Your country continues to face serious economic, social and humanitarian challenges and finds itself on the front line of the large scale arrival of migrants, asylum seekers and refugees seeking shelter from prosecution of poverty. Your country has had to take difficult decisions requiring strong political leadership. It chose that not to step back from Europe, and now Europe must not turn its back on Greece. European solidarity is essential. The timing of your address to our Assembly is all the more pertinent, as this week we are discussing the situation of refugees in Greece. Prime Minister, we are keen to hear your message to us. You have the floor. Κύριε Πρόεδρε, κύριε Γενική Γραμματέα του Συμβουλίου της Ευρώπης, Mr. President, uh, Secretary General of the Council of Europe, dear colleagues, members of this Parliamentary Assembly, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor for me indeed to be able to address the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. I appreciate that honor. I stand here as a representative of my country, Greece, and I would like to start by expressing my deep feelings and my uh, gratitude. Uh, like all other Greek citizens, I cannot forget the significant support extended by the Council of Europe uh, to the Greek people when we were fighting for democracy under the dictatorship of the colonels. The Council of Europe made it possible for those who resisted the colonels to express themselves, to give witness. To give witness to the fact that there were political prisoners, that people were being tortured, and that was heard everywhere in Europe. The Council of Europe isolated and condemned the regime of the colonels. And the then consultative council on 30 January 1969 closed the door to Greece and recommended to the Committee of Ministers that Greece be excluded from the Council of Europe. And that resolutely democratic decision was very much in line with the values and the objectives of the Council of Europe. It was an unique attitude among international organizations. It was something that protected human rights, a parliamentary regime, and uh, the rule of law in the member states. This uh, honors uh, the European Convention of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms, uh, a convention which, uh, together with the uh, European Social Charter, which was signed in Turin in 1961, really constitutes the cornerstone of our common post-war European approach to the organization of societies, the recognition of workers' rights to a decent, dignified salary, the protection of trade union rights, the protection of the right to engage in collective bargaining, the right of the elderly to have a social security, the combating of poverty and social exclusion. All of these provisions are to be found in in the revised European Social Charter. And this is uh, not uh, just uh, our 
continental acquis, if you will, but it also points the way uh, to an appropriate development of our societies in the future. It is really the only way to go for a social democracy. That is the way to ensure the dignity of individuals and social uh, cohesion. Now, freedom and democracy are in danger when social rights are not guaranteed. My country, Greece, and this is uh, an inexcusable delay, uh, did not uh, uh, ratify the uh, Social Charter of 1961 until 23 years later, namely 1984. And that uh, Social Charter who was uh, uh, ratified 20 years after it was adopted. And for our government, this ratification is finally uh, a sign of our attachment to social justice in Europe. But it is also a proof of our will to apply the principles of uh, social justice and the rule of law. But unfortunately, the European Social Charter is not binding. It does not contain binding provisions. It is uh, simply, through the notorious uh, Turin procedure, it is simply an effort to, to promote social rights through the work of national parliaments. And that is why this European Social Charter is a balancing force, but it is insufficient to protect uh, people again from the destruction of the European social model with more and more de deregulation. Now, uh, the European Union Social Charter does uh, recognize uh, certain fundamental social rights, uh, but that's not necessary. It is important uh, that the European Social Charter be transformed from a text of recommendations of pious wishes into something more binding, because social rights in Europe often are not protected. They are often undermined who should, by those who should be their guarantors. Uh, and it's sort of a social rights a la carte, depending on which country you're in. The uh, politic, politics of austerity, of budgetary rigor, of deregulation, through various uh, financial uh, support uh, mechanisms that have been put in place, all of this uh, is uh, pushing states uh, toward a situation in which they do not respect uh, their uh, basic commitments taken upon ratification of the European Social Charter. In its uh, recent case law, after uh, collective uh, proceedings brought by Greek trade unions, uh, uh, the courts have determined uh, that the European Social Charter is being violated by a number of the measures uh, being implemented in Greece, and this should must no longer continue. This must be stopped. Uh, Greece uh, reads uh, a clear cut uh, um, reorganization. Our labor market is already very flexible. We should not be pushing people down to the lowest common denominator. Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I stand here today before the Council of Europe one day before the British referendum, which, in which British voters will decide whether or not to keep the United Kingdom within the European Union. And please allow me to share my opinion with you about this referendum. I think that we all agree today that Europe finds itself in a situation of crisis and the very fact that tomorrow's referendum is taking place shows how deep-rooted the crisis is. And, of course, any pro-European force must react in a positive way to urge the UK to remain within the European Union. But I am convinced that uh, whatever uh, the result of tomorrow's uh, referendum, 
the consequences for our common European house will be uh, very uh, deleterious. Uh, leaving the European Union, going back into splendid isolation would be very harmful for the UK itself and for the European Union. But even the negotiation of some special status, uh, the refusal to afford the same social rights uh, to uh, EU citizens who are not British in the UK, that uh, too would be um, a very negative development uh, in the conservative direction. So I think it would be a negative European precedent. And at the same time, I do believe that we need to rethink our Europe. We need to understand that today the European social model is becoming a neoliberal model. And whatever the choice of the British people, we must all put ourselves uh, that uh, crucial question about uh, the direction that Europe is going to take, finding itself at a crossroads. Uh, I think we can take advantage of the crisis uh, to engage in deep-rooted reform and far-going reform. We need to take a hard look at our model and how it's functioning. The management uh, of our three simultaneous in parallel crises uh, uh, it's the, there's the economic crisis, the refugee crisis, and the security crisis. And all of this uh, has pushed Europe into a political and social crisis. A crisis uh, that is uh, shaking Europe at its very foundations and is undermining European unity. Uh, the uh, powerful forces in Europe uh, are continuing to uh, apply the rules and the rules are just resulting in a lot of problems. Uh, let uh, me take the example of countries uh, that have a high public debt and uh, that uh, situation of course has become worse uh, because of the austerity policy and because of the economic crisis and this has made it very difficult for those countries to return to growth and the only credible solution uh, to put the crisis behind us uh, must be based on uh, the confidence of investors and investors will once again put their trust once uh, there is a return to a sustainable level of public debt. Uh, countries uh, should be able to finance their own debt uh, and have access uh, to financial markets. Uh, now, of course, uh, when I talk about those countries, I have in mind, first and foremost, my own country, Greece. Ladies and gentlemen, I think that uh, the uh, failure of the neoliberal model for managing the crisis with austerity as the main weapon to be deployed has become a reality. That's clear. We have 22 million people unemployed in Europe. And that shows that the crisis is not behind us. The crisis is ongoing. It's well entrenched in Europe. And the very high level of long-term unemployed, about half of those 22 million are long-term unemployed uh, as of uh, 2015. And that's a figure that has doubled between 2008 and 2015. And this uh, shows that the unemployment in Europe is really systemic. 22 million unemployed, 11 million of them long-term. That really is an entire country, an entire country wiped off the map of Europe. Long-term unemployment is a very serious political problem that Europe must confront head-on. And the failure of austerity policies at the national level with the recession, with uh, excessive debt, uh, with uh, uh, plummeting uh, remuneration, all of this is 
showing that we are confronted with a problem with a European dimension. And competition among states for salaries is something that can result in competitive uh, advantage in theory. But the differences between the northern countries and the southern countries are becoming larger uh, with people looking at their own nations for solutions uh, despite the interstate competition. And that is why there is growing Euroscepticism in the southern part of Europe. And in the northern part of Europe, we are seeing a tendency uh, to a call for derogations uh, and to be able not to have to apply all of the acquis communautaire. And this uh, growing economic crisis uh, has awoken the monster of uh, populism and uh, uh, of extreme uh, right-wing policies. Uh, those who were formerly in isolation have now appeared on the political arena. <clears throat> in some countries, the extreme right uh, even threatens to take over political power, or at least to uh, undermine or destabilize the existing political power. A Europe uh, that uh, is closing its borders to refugees and opening its borders to austerity a Europe of uh, supranationalism when you ha want to have common rules uh, for refugees uh, but then you forget uh, national uh, sovereignty when it comes to austerity. Well, that Europe is really trampling on its own fundamental values uh, and its unity and its cohesion. It is a Europe that has pushed itself into a profound crisis uh, and has become incapable of uh, convincing peoples that it is in their interest uh, to support and strengthen Europe. I think it is uh, blatantly obvious that the response to the crisis can be neither the neoliberal model nor growing nationalism with each country uh, trying to manage on its own. And we have to fill in that gap, and we have to do it very quickly. We need to react uh, collectively on the basis of no particular ideology, on the basis uh, of no uh, preconceived notions, but really come back uh, to the principles of democracy, of justice, of solidarity, of equality, of respect for human rights and for social rights. And this. Uh, in order to be able to strengthen our cohesion and to be more unified in moving forward. We all need more Europe and not less Europe, but we need first and foremost a better Europe. And to achieve that, we need to change our policies, we need to strengthen democracy, to get back in touch with European citizens by strengthening the institutions of democratic governance and by combating inequality. We need to strengthen the social dimension of Europe and to do that we must come to an agreement about social cohesion. We cannot opt for policies that are most disadvantageous for European workers. We really need a new social contract for Europe. And that is something we must fight for. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, the economic crisis, the refugee crisis, the migrant crisis that I've referred to, uh, these are crises, these are challenges for Europe as a whole. And that really calls upon us to confront these uh, challenges uh, with joint and common mechanisms so that we can promote European values. Uh, as uh, you all know, 
Greece has been confronted with and buffeted by these uh, crises uh, perhaps uh, more than anyone else, especially when it comes to the refugee crisis. Uh, uh, the Greek government, uh, Greek volunteers and foreign volunteers, local authorities, uh, NGOs uh, in mainland Greece and on the islands uh, are all making Herculean efforts uh, every day with a view to being able to deal with, to welcome, to support uh, the at least uh, one million refugees uh, who uh, arrived in Greece in 2015. More than 160,000 lives have been saved at sea, and most of the individuals uh, saved at sea were children, the elderly, or members of other vulnerable groups. And I'm very uh, pleased that this has now been recognized uh, by the Council of Europe uh, with the prizes awarded to two Greek NGOs. Now, of course, uh, these efforts are continuing, they're ongoing. Uh, currently in Greece, uh, we have uh, 68,000 migrant refugees, and over a period of 20 days, uh, when the Balkan countries unilaterally decided to close their borders, uh, despite the contrary decision taken by the European Council, uh, this meant that uh, 68,000 people were trapped. Uh, in my country. Now, that may seem to you to be a very small number, but compared to the Greek population, 68,000 refugees is not a small number. The equivalent numbers for Greece, for Germany, France, and Italy would be between 100 and 200,000. And this uh, has really been the result of the closing of the border between Greece uh, and uh, uh, the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. There was the Edomini camp there, which was uh, uh, finally uh, emptied without violence. Uh, whereas in other countries, these sorts of illegal camps uh, are also being evacuated, but that's being done with a lot of force and violence. So today we have created 55,000 uh, uh, places or shelters uh, for the individuals concerned. Obviously, their living conditions there are not ideal, but we're doing everything that we can to improve them. And we offer these individuals all of the um, survival conditions that are required, the primary needs that they have are met. Uh, and of course, we need uh, European funding to be able to continue to do this. And we are uh, cooperating with the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, with non-governmental organizations, uh, which in fact directly receive two-thirds of the European funds that we use to take care of these refugees. We try to deal with the daily difficulties by registering and identifying every individual who arrives on a Greek island. And we take care of these individuals uh, right uh, from the beginning of the submission of uh, their request uh, for asylum. The asylum service and the asylum appeal service in application of European law and international law informs all refugees and migrants uh, of their rights and obligations examines their asylum applications separately and individually uh, and uh, in full respect of the rights of each applicant. I would like to underscore that these are uh, applications for asylum in Greece because as has been uh, noted by Frontex uh, and uh, NGOs, uh, 
uh, individuals uh, uh, have been encouraged uh, to submit applications for asylum not with a view to remaining in Greece but in the hope uh, that uh, their uh, pathways uh, to other parts of Europe would once again be opened and I would like to thank uh, the European uh, Commission and uh, so for their very responsible approach adopted and finally I would say that we take particular care of vulnerable groups and especially unaccompanied minors and we seek to achieve family reunification for those who were blocked in our country after the unilateral closing of the Balkan route. Their applications are examined on a priority basis uh, and within our existing structures we have some 500 unaccompanied minors uh, and on the basis of an action plan drawn up uh, with the United Nations uh, High Commissioner for Refugees and NGOs we are going to put in place uh, additional uh, structures uh, for the hosting of some additional 400 unaccompanied minors and that will be done in July. A number of other internal measures are being put in place, uh, uh, a register of tutors, uh, uh, strengthening the possibility for uh, placing children in foster families, the development of an electronic uh, platform for uh, tracing minors uh, and uh, hopefully uh, we will be able to take advantage uh, of a contribution from the Council of Europe Development Bank uh, for our work in this sector which is a very high priority for us indeed. And it is in this respect that we will be submitting a proposal to the European Commission to the effect that unaccompanied minors who are less than 10 years old and who are blocked on Greek territory uh, and, who, uh, and who have been there since before the 19th of March, uh, that they be uh, priority candidates for relocation to other European states, whatever their nationality. And I think that you can appreciate that that would be a positive step. Ladies and gentlemen, it is clear, I think, that the financial crisis, the migration crisis, are crises that cannot be resolved through nationalistic navel-gazing and through policies that would put the responsibilities on the shoulders of the most vulnerable countries that would violate the rights of the most vulnerable groups. The uh, xenophobic policies, uh, the uh, refoulement at sea idea, various other actions that seek to deal with the problem of migrants as a problem only from for the frontline countries. Well, all of that is in violation of European values and threatens the future of Europe's ethics. Greece is continuing to try to deal with this problem, but we believe that the migration crisis is something that requires a solidarity. It is something that we must work on all together. It is only by cooperating with the countries of transit and the countries of origin that we will be able to deal appropriately with this phenomenon. We need to put a lot of stress on the resolution of conflicts through humanitarian cooperation and through more uh, interconnection uh, between our refugee policy or migration policy and our foreign policy. And in this respect, Greece has uh, strengthened its cooperation with Turkey, which together with Jordan and the Lebanon uh, is uh, the, uh, one of the three countries that has received the most refugees. There are three million of them in Turkey. And in this uh, respect, uh, Euro-Turkish cooperation as well as uh, the NATO operations in the Aegean Sea have uh, been deployed and thanks uh, to the huge efforts made by Greek, Turkish and European authorities, uh, the flow of seven to 8,000 uh, migrants uh, per day to the islands in the Aegean Sea that we observed in November last uh, has now been 
stanched down to less than 1,000 person per day. And what is most important is that we have not been observing those tragic deaths at sea that we all deplored along the smugglers' routes in the recent past. Now, the irregular routes taken by smugglers have been replaced by a legal route into Schengen states from Turkey. And so that former situation that we were also ashamed of has now been resolved. And this new route has been used by hundreds of uh, refugees uh, over the last uh, few months, uh, and we expect it uh, to become a permanent uh, route uh, for uh, thousands of individuals who want to settle in Europe. Ladies and gentlemen, dear parliamentarians, many efforts have been made but we need to do a lot to improve the migration management process. On a daily basis, the asylum service and the migration ministry, which didn't even exist a few years ago, are uh, sharing a huge burden and making tremendous efforts to fulfill their mission. So on this occasion, I would like publicly to thank the Greek people, the Greek woman and man in the street, the volunteers, the ministries, but in particular the minister responsible for the uh, migration ministry, Yanis Muzalas, all of whom are waging this uh, daily combat to ensure humanitarian support for the refugees. This is not someone who has uh, come out of a political milieu, but he has uh, a very broad experience as a physician. He's been a member of a number of humanitarian organizations. He's an excellent organizer, and he has managed uh, to ensure coordination good coordination among all of those nationally and internationally who are contributing to dealing with this humanitarian problem. Now, as of now, we do expect that there will be fair distribution of the welcome burden across, uh, the, across Europe. The frontline countries uh, should not uh, uh, share all of the burden. We do expect uh, our partners uh, to take up uh, their responsibilities on the basis of uh, solidarity. Uh, it's uh, not just solidarity vis-a-vis -vis fellow member states in Europe. Uh, it's a solidarity vis-a-vis -vis the values of the organization that they have joined. Now, solidarity means uh, that I share the problem without uh, undermining those who will work with me to deal with the problem. So we expect uh, a significant uh, speeding up in the relocation processes. We expect a fair application of the Dublin Agreement in order that everyone take on the burden that is rightfully theirs. Uh, and in this respect, uh, we also hope to be able to cooperate with the Council of Europe in order to take advantage of Council of Europe expertise, especially in the field of human rights. And it was with particular pleasure that I recently welcomed the Secretary General and the President of the Parliamentary Assembly in Greece, and we had an opportunity to talk about how we can work together. It is clear that the migrant and refugee crisis is a crisis that we can confront effectively only if we look at the root causes uh, having given rise to that um, armed conflict, uh, impoverishment, uh, climate change, uh, violation of human rights. And therefore, we must uh, coordinate uh, more in order 
to avoid deterioration of the security crisis in Europe, a crisis which is not only resulting in the destabilization of the countries close to Europe, but is also resulting in the setting up of terrorist networks within our European societies. So Europe is called upon to find solutions that will protect it and protect its values. Solutions that will make it possible for us to uh, confront uh, terrorism abroad and to ensure that we have the right conditions for uh, peace, security and reconciliation in those countries. Uh, solutions uh, that uh, will protect European citizens and protect the rule of law in Europe. Greece as a European country a country which is located on the Mediterranean and is close to those countries located on the Dead Sea continues to be active in its foreign policy which is multi-dimensional in this region. During this period of increased regional confrontation and destabilization we must enter into dialogue, we must work together at a bilateral level but also at a multilateral level with the countries in the Mediterranean, our neighboring countries on the Dead Sea and in the Balkan countries as well. We must use international law to defend our sovereign rights. We need to work together with the international community to find a sustainable solution for the situation in Cyprus. The UN Security Council documents on this matter relating to the status of Cyprus, which is a member of the European Union. A solution to this issue will increase the sense of security for all inhabitants of Cyprus. We are in favor of UN initiatives to support peace and stability in Ukraine, Libya, and all countries affected by conflict. We are in favor of finding solutions for the situations in the Middle East. We want to see a Palestinian state which is sovereign, which can coexist in a peaceful manner with Israel. Furthermore, we want to strengthen the monitoring of our borders. We will cooperate with our partners to deal with the issues of terrorism and extremism. At the same time, respecting international law, European law and human rights. Ladies and gentlemen, as you can understand, we are undertaking significant, we have been undertaking significant efforts over the past 18 months to deal with the migration crisis and the financial crisis. However, security challenges increase. The protection of fundamental rights in Greece means that we have been active in many other areas. We have introduced civil partnerships for homosexual couples in December last year. So we have been working to guarantee equality for all Greek citizens. We have introduced new forms of equality in our legislation, whatever their gender orientation, whatever their sexuality. We want to protect all people from fear and intolerance. This is our democratic inheritance, which has led to an improvement in the lives of many Greeks. This change in the law has resolved many issues for these citizens relating to um, divorce and inheritance. We are working to combat discrimination and racism. We are looking to change our law on nationality. 
We want to um, guarantee that second generation children of immigrants can have access to Greek citizenship. Children who have been born in Greece to parents who are migrants and who want to study in our country, we want to guarantee that their lives are easier. We have also introduced a legislative program to, introduce, to improve the situation in our prisons. We want to deal with the problem which exists on, with overpopulation. We are also working on reforms to our national health system. We want to improve the situation in our centers for those suffering from drugs addiction. We are also working to improve the systems we have for improving the situation of our Roma population. The Roma population in Greece and in Europe are extremely vulnerable. We have introduced a national monitoring system for Roma and we are also going to introduce a national secretariat within the Ministry of Solidarity to resolve the issues which they are confronted with. In the near future we are going to build a mosque and a Muslim cemetery in Athens. This has been something which has been planned for a long time now. We want to respect the Muslim population of Athens, but this isn't the only reason we are doing this. We want to protect our own values at the same time. Ladies and gentlemen, parliamentarians, today Europe is confronted with a major challenge. We need to re-establish economic stability and at the same time, we want to protect social rights and social cohesion. Your assembly, which is a vital body within an institution which provides models for the rule of law, democracy and human rights, is in a privileged um, position. And as such, you are the voices, the conscience of European citizens. Your task is a di difficult one. You have to study the responses available and offer solutions to those challenges which threaten the European construction and which threaten human rights. Greece believes that the role of the Council of Europe as a unifying force based on shared principles and values is irreplaceable and has contributed and will continue to contribute to fulfilling its goals. Allow me to underscore our ongoing consist, um, commitment to the construction of a democratic Europe, a Europe of solidarity, a Europe of tolerance, a Europe based on the values and the principles of the Council of Europe. This is vital if we are to confront the challenges which we are confronted with in our countries. And we must do this in an institutional and constitutional level as we have been doing for the past two years. And I'm sure that you will work as best you can to this end. Ladies and gentlemen, we are counting on you. We believe that your efforts cannot be replaced. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Prime Minister. Well, unfortunately, uh, this has taken up uh, most of the time allotted. Uh, we are going to find it very difficult to move on to the list.